All right. So as I was saying, um, let me go back to Tycho. So Tycho, it's Tycho dies, um, 1601. Kepler is actually there. Um, he actually, Tycho turns to Kepler and says, you know, let me not have lived in vain, which uh, that's one of his, his famous uh, quote as he's dying. Um, and, and so uh, Kepler takes that to, to mean, hey, you know, I've got access to all of Tycho's data. Um, now, here's the, the thing is, uh, um, Tycho's um, family, you know, they, they know he's got all this data and they know he, sp he spent a lot of time accumulating the data. I mean, you know, like I said, t more than 20 years on Mars alone. I mean, that, that's a lot of information to sit there and watch night after night and record the positions, the, the positions of, of, of all the different planets, but, you know, in particular Mars. Um, so so, so uh, Tycho Brahe's uh, family, you know, after he's dead, uh, uh, they, 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 they don't want to release the data to Kepler. They, they, they know that Kepler and he didn't get along. Um, and then and and it's not like they have, they don't have, they have no idea <laughs> what, what this data contains. I mean, they, they, you know, they can't, even, you know, they can't even interpret it really. Um, you know, it's, it's only if you're, you know, trained, to, to, to understand this kind of stuff. Um, so, so, you know, Kepler's really the only one who could, practically the only person on the planet at the time. Um, I mean, there are very few, but, but Kepler in particular is, is, is right there ready to use it. And basically Kepler leaves. He takes, he takes the data and he just, he, he's gone, right? So I think, I think they lived, I think, um, I could be wrong about this, but I think Tycho's family that, you know, he had this castle, I think it was in Denmark or something like that. And so Kepler just leaves and takes the data with him. All right. So the, and now that becomes really important because he discovers um, using, using the data, he discovers the laws of planetary motion. Okay. So Kepler comes up with these three laws of planetary motion. Make sure you know all three, all right? So that's the that's, that's standard question, uh, you know, in astronomy is what order, you know, what's Kepler's first law? What's his second law? All right, so I'm gonna, we'll go through them right now. And what's his third law? And, and I'll do examples of the third law. That's the one that's more mathematical. All right, so the first law is, is, is actually um, something that you're gonna do in lab um, if you haven't already. Um, it's it, so the first law. I mean, it's a, it's actually a huge departure from you know thousands of years of 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 you know things moving in the heavens in perfect circles, going all the way back to the time of Pythagoras. So Kepler, um, and now Kepler doesn't want to do this, right? He Kepler is still you know. Um, he's been trained just like Tycho Brahe was, just like everyone was at the time, um, that, that things travel in the heavens with perfect circles, in, in perfect circles. But no matter what, and he tries for a long time to get, to get Mars, to get the orbit of Mars to be a perfect circle. Now, now he knows that, he knows that, that, that he's, got, he's got in front of him the most accurate data on the planet. Right, top Tycho Brahe's data, and and he says, you know, okay, I'm going to accept the data for what it is, and he again cannot get the the planet Mars to to travel in a perfect circle, um, so he's so out of desperation, he tries some different shapes, and one that he comes across that where it exactly works is what's called the ellipse. All right, so the ellipse is kind of an off-centered circle. There, here's a good picture of one. The planets don't really do this. This is this is an extreme situation where, you know, the, this this plus sign right here would be the sun. This is more like what a comet does, okay? So the planets are really almost circles, um, but but they're they're just, you know, they're the the, the planet okay, so let me let me go over this. Um so so planets travel in elliptical orbits, right? That's 
Kepler's first law. Right? Um, an ellipse is um, kind of an off-centered circle. Uh, it has what's called a major axis. So that's, you know, the, the longer part of, of, of the, um, the enclosed region. Um, so that's called the major axis. And the distance from one side of the major axis to the middle of the ellipse is called the semi-major axis. That's really important to know that. And, and we usually give that the symbol A. So A is the semi-major axis. It's kind of like the average distance a planet is from, from, from the sun. Right? So that's a good way of thinking of it. Um, although, you know, the planet is constantly traveling at different distances from the sun, but that's, we'll get to that shortly. There's a minor axis, so that's exactly perpendicular to the major axis. Um, and there's actually a mathematical relationship between the major axis and the minor axis um, and, and the distance to the focal points, which is not shown here, um, but you're going to do that in lab if you haven't already. And then there's this other quantity um, called the eccentricity. So the eccentricity, um, oh, actually this, 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 is, this would be the position, so where this hash mark is and where this hash mark is right here. That, that, that's, um, sometimes that's called C, which is the distance between the focal point and the center of the ellipse. And then this focal point, there's always two focal points with ellipses. Um, and, and this is how you draw an ellipse. We'll, we'll, we do this in lab as well. You put two, um, two push pins in, and then you take some, some, some string and you hold it taunt and then you draw um, you know, you, you complete the ellipse, right? So you draw it on one side and then flip the string over and draw it on the other side. And that, that what you what the result is, and is an ellipse where the sun is, a, is, is one of the focal points of the ellipse. All right. So anyhow, um, so the eccentricity is, um, you know, the greater this number is the, 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 the close, so, you know, this is this example of like a comet that has a large eccentricity. The eccentricity is um, between zero and one. So zero eccentricity is a perfect circle. So a circle is actually just a special case of an ellipse. Um, so 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 you know that that would be zero eccentricity, and this would be an eccentricity uh, very close to one. So may, maybe you know like. 0.75 or something like that. All right, the, 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 the planets have relatively small eccentricities, actually, except for, um, of, of all of them, Mars actually has one of the largest eccentricities. And it turns out that if, if Kepler, um, uh, we'll go back to Tycho, if Tycho had, um, if, if Kepler didn't use the data, you know, like the 20 years of data on Mars, he used some other planet, he would have gotten a circle. He would, he would have, he would have uh, actually worked out a circle. But it's because of, it's because of the fact that Mars has a large, a relatively large eccentricity. Not, not, not really large. It's not like a comet, but uh, anyhow. All right. So, so here's, you know, the different eccentricities where the sun is at the, at the, the focus, not the center, it's at one of the, it, they're called foci. There's always two of them, um, but the sun is at one of them. All right. Um, and then, he, you know, he, he, he was um, looking at the data again, Taiko Brahe's data, and he finds, um, and this is actually very much, uh, very close to uh, uh, calculus, by the way, it's, it's not. Um, but he makes the following observation, Kepler in particular, is that um, he, he comes up with this, what's called the second law of planetary motion. The first law, planets travel in ellipses. The second law is a little more complicated. It says that a planet will sweep out an equal area. Okay, so let's say that this, the planet goes from this point to this point in a two month period. This area, the shaded region right here, will equal when the planet, so when the planet is, is over here and in its orbit, you know, further away from the sun, 
Um, it, in, in the exact same amount of time, in the two month period, it sweeps out this, this shaded area is the same area as this shaded area. And if you ever had calculus before, um, calculus is always interested in the area under a curve, right? That's a very standard thing that, uh, that the mathematics of calculus can tell you. So, you know, the, he, he really came close, um, not, not with this, but he, he was, um, he did come close to, to figuring out, uh, or discovering calculus. All right. So anyhow, um, a, not, a better way, I think personally, a better way of describing the second law of planetary motion is this, that when a planet is closer to the sun, it travels faster. And when it's further from the sun, it travels slower. Right? The equal area in equal time is the same. It means the same thing, but that's just a better, I, I think, a, just an easier way of thinking about it. Um, faster when it's, when it's closer to the sun, slower when it's moving, when, when it's furthest from the sun. All right, so that's the second law. Now, the third law brings mathematical precision to the heavens for the for the very first time as a matter of fact just to just to let you know Kepler's the first one to do it and it takes him years and years of combing through um uh Tycho Brahe's data it, it this, this stuff does not just jump out at you and um, you got to really work at it and, and and if you think about it his t during the time of Kepler there's no, there's no calculators, there's no computers, nothing like that. So, um, you know, the fact that he comes up with it is, is amazing in and of itself. Uh, but, but here's, here's the third law. If you take the period of, of a planet, right? Now, now that's something can, that's been observed for, you know, for thousands and thousands of years, right? So, so you know, we know, during Kepler's time, there were only five planets, six if you include the Earth. But if it, the the period of a planet in years is proportional to the cube of what's called the semi-major axis. Again, the average distance the planet is from its from its star from from the star, right from from the sun, I should say. Um, now, a a has to be measured in units called AUs, where so, so you can see Kepler's, Kepler's third law works for this, for the earth really well. One year, well, one squared is one. And then, um, one, one astronomical unit, one AU is the dis, is the average distance between earth and the sun. And so one cubed is equal to one squared. So that, that works really well. And by the way, this, this equation, so this is called his, his third law of planetary motion. Kepler also called it his harmonic law uh, because he felt that this brought mathematical harmony to the universe. Um, at any rate, you gotta, you gotta, uh, and th th by the way, this, this, this Kepler's third law is kind of an insight in, into orbital motion throughout the universe. Okay, that, that's a big statement. I mean, he, he only knew about, I mean, he knew about the stars, but he had no idea how far away they were. Um, uh, he was just talking about the planets going around the sun. But this turns out to be a kind of almost a universal. If, if you modify this, and we're going to see that this gets modified very, very shortly after Kepler, um, a generation or so after Kepler, uh, that this gets modified into a universal law. All right, so um, Ke Kepler is just talking about the, the the planets in our solar system, even the comets, by the way, the comets orbit, anything orbiting the sun. It has to be in orbit, and it has to be orbiting our sun. P cubed, yeah, sorry, P squared, where, where P is the period in years, is equal to A cubed, where A is the, is the, distance that the object is from the sun. Well, the, the, sem, the semi-major axis, which is the average distance the object is from the sun. 
All right, so that that's it for this for this.